there are plenty of incentives that come to physicians. But they paid the doctor to write for the generic versions of the prescription. But if it didn't work, getting the doctor to change their mind, well, if they don't make their quota for the percentage of prescriptions, they don't get the bonus. The bonus comes from... Today, I'm having on Dr. Boz, AKA Dr. Bosworth. Many of you probably know exactly who she is. She's a world famous internal medicine physician, and she's famous because she's helped literally millions solve their health problems through ketosis. She's been featured on CNN, Fox News, Time Magazine. Her YouTube platform has almost half a million subscribers on it. And what I really liked about today's conversation is we didn't talk about things that most people in this field talk about. We went really off script and actually talked about the incentive programs that doctors are given to prescribe things like statins, to prescribe things like antidepressants, what that actually looks like, what the reality looks like. If you're into this kind of stuff, go ahead and hit subscribe. The bigger the audience gets, the bigger the guests on that I can have, which is something we all want because then we get the information that we're looking for, which is ultimately the truth. Let's get into it. How does the incentive program work for doctors? And before we get into that, it probably makes sense. Like, what is your background? So I am... 22 years into uh, internal medicine. I inherited uh, a practice from a retiring physician who's you know, probably in his 70s. And here I am, 29, 30 years old, whatever I was. A few months into my practice, I get a report. And um, the company said, yes, we track uh, primary care physicians and we measure their quality. And the quality is to look at how well your patients that have diabetes, what's their hemoglobin A1C? What's their average blood sugar? How well is their blood pressure controlled? And are they on a statin, which is by definition, the rule you're supposed to follow. And here was this report and I'm looking for my name on this, on this sheet. And actually, I was a number. So everybody gets a number. You know your number. And so you're looking for where your number ranks and how well you're controlling things. How well is your, you know, A1C? How well are your blood pressures? How well is your... And I'm at the bottom of all of this. <laughs> you're not dishing them out. You weren't dishing them out and I was like... <laughs> oh, no. I I'm very competitive. Yeah. It was the first hint that I knew that when you say how are incentives uh, developed. Um, and, and the chart, basic, so I can clarify, like, it's measuring how many statins you gave out. And other right, so it's, it's looking for, so specifically I remember the report for the diabetics. Yeah. Statins were one of the, uh, you know, one of the requirements for standard of practice. And so you'd get this chart and mine was the worst. Oh my gosh, I'm at that very bottom. Uh, what was, how many of your patients in the last five visits, how many of them were on a statin? And I think we were at 50% or something, which is, Terrible. You're supposed to be at 95% or something. Okay, so it was like measuring the the product, how much it's distributed versus the blood pressure yeah. and all of that. I think it's... Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, you think, okay, so I'm a new physician and I say, oh, I just got a report that, you know, they blind your, your name so none of your colleagues know you're the worst. But I'm sitting around a table of five other physicians that I've just met I'm like, all right, I'm the worst. What I'm the this is my number. Show me somebody who can be good at this. And if this is what you're measuring to tell me I'm a good doctor, I, I guess I better figure that out. So it's this cultural thing that said, no, you are your reports, especially when you're in a system like that. It really, it really would pull out the the outliers, the people who are really need some rehabilitation <laughs> for their practice. Uh, but. I'll tell you what, what I reflect on in that time is I, I really wanted these patients to do something. I wanted them to have good blood sugars and I wanted to have blood pressure medicines that got their blood pressure down. And, you know, I started writing statins on every single one of them. I mean, without a visit, just saying you're supposed to be on a statin, you're supposed to be on a statin. So just trying to find a way to deliver the care without them, even if they weren't in front of me yet. And well, that ticked off a lot of people because you skip the relationship. That's not going to work. But the second part was, when we got to know them, there was a ton of them that they were depressed. Um, nobody told me that I was um, in the number one female depressed market in the country. Yeah, I heard you. You're talking about that. It was like 
you did uh, like hundreds of brain scans and like well and i don't know if it was brain scans but like um kind of like screening that. yeah that's right to see who was depressed and it was like you found one who wasn't like just people just being depressed it women awful. so it's kind of like you got in there not knowing what to expect and it was like suddenly you had all these measures of success that had to do with prescribing the right medication let's say um and not necessarily looking at really the quality of the results and the quality of life yeah and then beyond that you know it's like you only have x amount of time to spend with these people because it's a system of going through and and what did you say the amount of time was typically yeah 20 minutes is is like a long visit i'm trying to absorb you know 17 prescriptions on their problem list you know on their med list and a problem list that's twice as long and i mean even if i did one you know review a minute i didn't get through them all it wasn't fun for me either like i don't i don't want to just be the prescription and only help here at yeah i thought i was doing this to help people and you know you so say it it's the system as i as i exited i found oh my gosh i'm in the middle of a machine mm. and um i never the soul sucking on me as well. Like, oh God, this is awful. And, you know, I, those screeners were a, a big liberation. I can, I can at least measure why I was so frustrated, but it's all of them. How do I have all of them? How is everyone depressed? So I, I, I pushed diabetes aside. I started doing these little workshops uh, for free. I taught about the brain and how it was working and how when you're metabolically that ill and your blood sugars are, that high when your blood pressure is that high when you're that overweight um the brain can't work right right and you know we can help you feel a little better with the prescription but there's a whole lot more to this than than my little prescription pad and a pill every day but i don't think it's you know it's not an accident that our um the the trials for every type of depression medicine the margins for approval by the fda are just slim they're just this slim about placebo hmm. and to get it to happen two or three times in a row is not guaranteed even with the best of medicines uh that the pill just changes that chemistry a little bit and it really is a chemical shift in the mind in your brain that is holding people depressed that if you want to shift chemistry my pill is nothing compared to removing the carbohydrates and having this you know a state of ketosis at least some hours in the week yeah and um boy i never looked so good until i did that prozac never fixes never fixes prozac is not bad but what what i it, it's it, it's only going to change the needle by about you know a few percentage points of that neurotransmitter in their brain and you need a tidal wave to get better yeah and then we were looking at um you know, reviewing what they're eating. And when you eat 15, you know, seven meals a day. Yeah. I don't care if it's only two bites. You you can't fix insulin problems when you eat that often. Isn't that wild? That's what we were all told to do. I mean, I got some, you're touching a lot of things that I can relate to. I was on Prozac for 10 years when I was like 15 to like, which is crazy young. Oh, wait. I was, I think I was, maybe I was 16, but super young and also then I had like a nutritionist person that I hired and had a trainer. And like, that was the whole thing. It was like, eat seven meals a day, keep your metabolism going. Insulin uh, is your enemy at that point. And eating that many times a day, your body does a great job of producing insulin. Well, and so that's the brain. And yeah, that, this, this is what's interesting about insulin too. This is where I always, you know, I don't have diabetes or anything, but like, it seems kind of like the system you were describing in that we're just providing more of the so-called solution, like the insulin. So we give people who have diabetes more insulin. Where it's like, well, shouldn't the solution be to like reduce the sugar? It's right, yeah. Right? Like the carbs. I mean, that's kind of that's the part that I don't get. It's like the statins. It's like, okay, we're just gonna keep giving people, feeding people statins and all these, you know, solutions for their problems. But it's like, why don't we just fix the problem before it's a problem where that's what doesn't make sense yeah and when you study how uh how the machine changes these you know, very motivated and inspirational students into one of the standard physicians of today 
uh, it it isn't it isn't an accident that they all know that when they first within a month of seeing the first patient on your own that wait a minute you didn't start a prescription or stop a prescription so the amount you can bill is is like one tenth so if you're just going to educate them. You should do that for free somewhere else besides an exam room. Like, what? Isn't it the job for me to teach them? The root of a physician is to teach? And what you what you learn quickly is um, the reports did actually have that in there, too. How many of the 99215s and 99214s did you see? Because that's the highest level you can build in a 20-minute section is a 99214. It, it's a code for Medicare and Medicaid and insurances that say that the complexity of this patient has, you know, this many medical problems, they talked about this many prescriptions, and the reimbursement is, you know, whatever it co correlates to it in your profession. And it's part of the, it's part of the reports. Okay, so like, as a doctor, as a physician, you are incentivized to create more of these situations on a report. What, are you you're financially getting a cut? And I, and I want to say, too, I don't think that doctors are the problem. I think it's the system that doc doctors are in that is flawed and probably the education that the doctors are getting at the baseline in terms of, you know, everybody's improving all the time, but we should be able to question things. Like you said, we should be able to challenge things. That's the point of science. So how are doctors getting paid or what what's the incentive to put these numbers on there? Will they get fired? Whatever, you know. Yeah, I mean, there's been several policymakers in the last how many decades? Start in 1970, like, okay, how do we make this a better approach for everybody? And as you have more and more of the population on Medicare and Medicaid, which is the government subsidized health care, uh, the rules became strict. We're not going to pay doctors to do things that other people could do. Other people can teach them nutrition, hmm. other people could teach them exercise. But only the physician can write the prescription. And so when you look at the baseline education, you've got four years. And really, two and a half of that uh, is the didactic side of it, the, the kind of textbooky side, where they need to learn everything that medicine has churned out in the last, you know, 300 years. Even the last 10 years is just a dollop of information. And so to push this through the brains of med students, it's, you know, nutrition they can figure out on their own. At least that's, you know, that's been the theory of some of these, the curriculums. Now, again, you're right, they're changing it. But I'm a product of, I was, all the nutrition I've learned is outside of medical training. Right. And it's, it's served me well to put the energy into it because I think it gets patients healthier. If you ask a, a lawmaker, a policymaker, that uh, their bill is going to be, you know, voted on and become law. Uh, one of the things they warn against is, will it create more positive or will it be, you know, will it create more problems? Is it a good law? Is it going to help the the majority or has it got some unforeseen flaws that sometimes you can only see when the policy is enacted? Mm -hmm. And I think medicine is a very good example for that. Like the intentions were, well, save that other stuff for the other people, except the doctors missed the education for some of those foundational nutritional chapters. And then the physician turns out to be the authority. So when patients would come into me and say, you know, acai berry says that it's an antioxidant. Should I take that? And I'm like, I don't know anything about that. Okay. I have no idea. So then right, you leave yeah. me the authority. And I'm like, your prescription is what I'm here to take care of. Yeah. You know, so the policy started out by saying you got to save the, you know, the most intense and the most dangerous, if you would. Uh, for the most educated. Okay, that's how the doctor got in charge of that. But when when you look at some of the incentive programs that have landed throughout the country, and a lot of them through Medicare and Medicaid, it is, they are programs that are run through an electronic medical record um, that sometimes are paid for by the government because, and they are usually metrics of, did the A1Cs get better? Did they lose weight? Did their blood pressures go down? Are they on less prescriptions? Those are all good metrics. But there are plenty of incentives that come to physicians that are paid for by the insurance companies that they know if the doctor 
writes for the Cymbalta, which was, I don't know, eight times as expensive as Prozac, maybe even more. Re- you know, relative to comparison, what was generic and what was it, you know, in the highest um, payment for an antidepressant. That if the doctor wrote more of the Cymbalta than the Prozac, um, he didn't. They didn't receive the incentive. But they paid the doctor to write for the generic versions of the prescription, which you want the lowest cost for the patient. That's hmm. not hard to figure out. But if it didn't work, getting the doctor to change their mind, well, if they don't make their quota for the percentage of prescriptions, they don't get the bonus. The bonus comes from the insurance company. Okay, that's bingo. That's what I wanted to get to. What, so help me iron this out a little bit is like how did that how that works like you may have Prozac like as our example the antidepressant right and then there's what was the other one called the more expensive one ah uh, Cymbalta so they're, I think they're both generic now but back in 1998 they weren't okay and what does generic mean like what does in your world yeah so that a um when a, a molecule that has been studied almost always paid for by the industry by the pharmaceutical companies has um, proven to be effective, they have the ability to hold that proprietary right on that molecule for a certain period of time. So once it's approved by the federal uh, regulations, that there's a timer on it, on how long they are the exclusive people that can offer that molecule for. Uh, they're, I mean, it's, it's not a bad plan. They're the ones putting in the investment for the research and development of that molecule. They need to have an exclusive right to, to use that to reap back their investment. They being the government. Work. Sorry. Yeah. No. That the when it's the when it's generic, then anyone can produce. It. Oh, privately owned could be mm-hmm. yeah, whoever. It, yeah, they're privately owned. Okay. So g- there are companies out there that work just in the generic market. They as soon as things go off of the the trademarked time, the the protected time, mm-hmm. that's what they produce. Um, and then there's the ones who put the the big money into how do you make uh, the best new molecule for the biggest problem. So that research and development has lots of failures, especially in mental health. So in this example, the return for their improvement is great when the drug works, but when you have at the front end, which is the prescriber, getting incentivized to write for the generic as opposed to the, the higher expense one, well, it limits the return on the investment for the for what that company put forth to develop that molecule. Okay, I think I get So the higher expense one might be the better one, the one that's more effective. But because the generic ones are the ones that, it's kind of like owning a patent to something. You have a certain amount of time that you can make money off. You can own it, essentially, and work with it. Yeah. Um, but it's like those are privately owned. And so the insurance companies, do they promote all you know the generic and the other ones or just the generic? Well, are they insurance, uh, they're covering your prescriptions, right? So, so they're looking at the bottom dollar saying, give me the cheaper one. A like hundred times to one, give me the cheaper one. And that's where they said, well, we'll look at how much money we would save if the doctor would just use that generic one. Take the practice I was taking over. He, they were all on generics. And they were all depressed. Hmm. I'm like, well, let's try something different. And uh, of course, using the tool that's in front of me, uh, there came a whole bunch of prescriptions that were not generic. When it came to generic use of antidepressants i'm like no i've had really good luck with this new one pretty much every person i put on it did better which is the more expensive like, ones it was more expensive yeah interesting and so you're like well you're not going to get your bonus i'm like what bonus oh that's so fascinating so the generic ones the ones that are cheaper are the ones that are covered by insurance and then if the doctors prescribe those because they're supposed to be cheaper and you know whatever then they make a bonus depending on how many they just prescribe um, but yeah. to your point, they're not necessarily as effective. They're not working for people. And you don't even have the information on food, nutrition, where you're just missing an entire piece of it, which is so not even fair for doctors because you don't even get the information to offer. So, and, and that's kind of going into what your field of study is, where you've helped so many people with your work. And you really focus on brain health, it seems. You emphasize um, people being in ketosis and... Um, I talk a lot about a lot of different ways of eating. I, I tend to eat more carnivore slash animal-based. Honestly, I hate saying carnivore, animal-based, keto. I think it all sounds, you know, it's, it's just worth it, you know. But it, it's it's a way to categorize it. So 
Um, ultimately, the whole point is like you and I are both talking about ways to use food to help people's brains, minds, souls, bodies, all that sort of stuff as medicine, it seems. So why do you think that having some carbs um, in a, where you would in ketosis, like under 20 grams, is better than having no carbs for the brain and mm-hmm. the body? Well, I, yeah, I think that um, that point of view is really the key there. And so when I look at uh, the state of ketosis, it, it is a powerful transition of altering the chemistry inside the brain that delivers a more stable fuel while reducing the inflammation and allowing the fastest repair inside the brain. And there's a whole bunch of tricks and trades that happen uh, in medicine trying to get that brain to do that. And, you know, it, it was a podcast between Tim Ferriss and Dom Diagostino, who uh, who blew my mind. Like, I'm pretty good at what I do. I'm hearing um, this podcast of what the Navy SEAL team was doing to repair an injured brain. Uh, and they were doing... a a, a ton of what I was doing, this you know, reprogramming, sleep, all the stuff that you have to do to get a good outcome. Uh, but in this case, what was taking me 18 months to get done, uh, Dom Diagostino and his team were getting done in a handful of months. What was taking me four years to get done, well, his team was getting outcomes in 18 months. Like, they were speeding up what I was doing because they started with ketones. It's, it's um, aging problems that I take care of. And if you want to see the fuel behind an, an aging problem, it's insulin. Mm. Uh, what's the best way to get the insulin as low as you possibly can? Be in ketosis. And yeah, I think what, what, what interests me is why do you think having 20 grams of carbs is better than having zero carbs? Like, because that's a huge argument. Should we not have any carbs? And but by that, I mean raw fruit, raw honey, those types of carbs, you know, not processed foods. Yeah, well, if you're, if you're doing 20 or less, you're not eating honey or fruit. Yeah, I mean, 20 carbs in today's world is, well, you should aim for zero because then you'll keep it under 20. Teaching them through a classroom called YouTube has turned out to be just woefully successful in transitioning people away from what I would have wanted to tell them if I was in front of them. And that is, you have chronic diseases called blood pressure, obesity, autoimmune disorders, a brain that's not working right. Uh, And you can call that Parkinson's or Alzheimer's or depression or bipolar. And I'm telling you, all of them get better when you change the fuel, not for a day or a week, but for a, a enough time that you turn over all these cells in a lower insulin state. And there are, there are arguments that say once a patient is insulin resistant, can you ever stop that pancreas from overproducing insulin in the future? And there's an argument about that. So you say zero versus 20. Well, I, I do want people to succeed. So I put the word 20 out there because when, when I get them to zero, I get them to 20. But what really happens is, first of all, they learn what carbs are. Second of all, they've learned how hard it is to give them up and that they might be addicted to something that was supposed to be nutritional. Mm-hmm. And now, if you want that to repair, just watch your own chemistry. Watch what happens when you have that sugar and it shoots way up and then it plummets way down, which says you overproduce insulin. And then to change that, you're going to need a persistent plan to re- regrow cells in a way that aren't in a high insulin bath. My question is, you know, earth and whatever God is gave us fruit and honey and like things like that, that we would eat if we were starving back in the day when we were foraging and we needed food and calories to get to the next day. If we didn't have meat, let's say, is that something that you think, let's say somebody is fixed their metabolism, they fixed their insulin over years is okay for one to bring in at that point because their gut's better and their brain's better? Or do you think that all of that is kind of like not meant for humans. Yeah, I mean, I, I think for thousands of generations, you know, tens of thousands of generations, the human response to food has been programmed. Uh, it wasn't until these last 50, 60 years that we processed it so high 
that you can take out sugar and put in honey to a population of people today. But what you can't control for is the amount of processed food that was going in there already. So the comparison of, you know, can you remove that? Well, what I really like about what you're teaching people and what you're exampling uh, in your life is that the less processed, the better. Mm -hmm. uh, can people add back in honey? I, I actually really hesitate to say that because of how many people that listen to me have had high insulin for 50 years. And they'll think, oh, she said on this one podcast. Yeah. I'm like, I wasn't talking to you. I was talking to the young person who's never been obese. Mm -hmm. And they were overweight and they were chronically ill and they had a brain issue. And then they got the body back into shape. They didn't have the 50 years of insulin that did, t did what you've done inside those cells. And so to, sit, to offer them times where... Um, you know, what would be a good idea? Uh, well, honey's harvested once a year. It's right. not supposed to be on the grocery store shelf every day. Uh, fruit was never this sweet, and it was available once a year. Mm -hmm. uh, Seasonal. Yeah, it's the, the abundance is the, the danger. The seven meals a day and the particle size is what really is a predictor for, I mean, when, when my patients come in and say, I'm going to do intermittent fasting, and I'm like, and what are you eating in the hours you eat? Intermittent fasting is a great idea of learning how to limit yourself. But if you stop focusing on the food that's going in and how much of it and how, how what's that particle size? How processed is it? Uh, and, I mean, spam is way better than the particleized whey protein for my been saying a lot. <laughs> it's just like, uh, it's got cartilage in it and some hoops <laughs> inside the... Uh, inside the spam jar. Um, and the particle size of the whey protein is so tiny that it stimulates an abundance of insulin. And yeah, yeah. hard insulin. Those are the kinds of, uh, you know, where they want it to be, you know, like they'll, they'll take a study that says, you know, and they'll bring it to me and they'll say, but look, honey is good for you. I'm like, honey, it was good for you before you were obese for the last 30 years. Yeah, I, I mean, I totally get what you're saying, actually. That's such a good point. I'm glad you said it because... I had this conversation with my sister. We talk about this all the time in that like, hey, does it make sense to not have fruit, to have sh some sugar here and there, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I talk with a lot of people that have been mor morbidly obese for like 30 years. You know what I mean? And like to be like, yes, you can have honey. I know what I was like when I had an eating disorder. My gut was so whacked out and I was so weird with insulin that like I would just binge yep. because I couldn't control it. And so... I know that if I open that door, if I opened that door for myself, it's just like, so to like almost, it, it's like there's types of people that have different approaches that they should take. To yeah, this. and the baggage that people bring into their illnesses, the, the mental scars of why they do things and whether or not they can even recognize that they're doing them, it's the, it's the biggest part of their success mm. it's a it's a shame that some people look at these approaches as as just diets you know because it's really not i mean when we are conscious of the foods we're eating and what that's doing to us um our addictions can be handled we can actually be a good you know the person that we want to be and you look at how that they they'll describe it as euphoria like i have not felt this way since i was a teenager yeah. And you're like, yep. But now the key is, how do you stay there? <laughs> it's the long game, you know, it's the long game. But carnivore is a great place where the temptations are so far removed. I think most of my followers are carnivore. I, I don't use the word because it's hard enough to say the word keto and not have it, people, you know, click away. Wait, what do I? I'm mostly carnivore. Where do people find you for socials? What's your Instagram or your YouTube channel? Name? Yeah, so, you know, they're old, and so they all have a little different one. So I can give you the links. But anything where you type in Dr. Boz, uh, B-O-Z, um, that's uh, the YouTube channel is probably the biggest thing. I do it live every Tuesday night, which is really where my community shows up, and they get to hear more about my life. But uh, I also have uh, a website, um, bozmd.com, that has plenty of activity on it and shows where I'll be speaking and um, has a Dr. Boss favorites page, which shows you all the things that I think people should be using in their life. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I try to keep that fresh and relevant. 
those are the best places to start and you can find all the links once you get to that page. So. Appreciate it, Dr. Buzz. Thank you so much for all of this. Genuinely, thank you. And I'll follow up. I'll text you after this. Thank you very much. And I look forward to being on your show again. So yes, ma'am.